do in chapter one here is he's going to give us a model, an outline of really how to succeed at honoring God in a world that doesn't. And by the way, that is exactly where God wants to place you, in a world that maybe doesn't know him, in a world that's often dark, places like Babylon. Babylon was lost. It was certainly dark spiritually. So why in the world would God send a guy like Daniel and and his friends to a place like that? Well, it's interesting because Jeremiah, who was also a, a prophet during the captivity time, stops and he gets this word really from God and God tells him exactly what he wants. And in Jeremiah chapter 27 or 29, verse 7, he said this, but seek the welfare of the city where I sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare you will find your welfare. What's he saying here? He's saying that God sent us there. Now, what Daniel's gonna do here in Daniel chapter one is gonna tell us really how to live and how to act and how to carry yourself in such a way that God will bless us and use us And you have to remember that Daniel is very young. He is somewhere around 15 years old. But even at an early age, he's committed. He's also very courageous. When Daniel stopped and sort of slowed down the Babylonian kingdom by saying, hang on a second, would you not let me defile myself, which is what we talked about last week, probably sent a ripple through everybody. It was a courageous thing he asked not to do. Would it be okay if I don't eat this food and I eat this other food? Because we find out in verse 10 that that very clearly the servant of of the chief eunuch comes and he says, look, if this doesn't turn out right, our heads roll. This is serious stuff. And he gets it. In verse 13, he's going to tell us, look, I get what it, just try me on this one, but I'm willing to do this. So he's a very courageous young guy, and he's very clear thinking. He goes into all of this idea that he's standing in this place where, where really he doesn't really want to be, he wouldn't have chosen this place, but he goes in and he has a plan. It's also interesting that in the middle of all this, you'll see that Daniel will not fight every fight that is out there in front of him. It's amazing we live in a world today where some people like to fight everything. I don't care what it is. They'll just just fight every single thing. Daniel doesn't do that. He's also uncompromising. It's interesting because, you know, all this this food, all this wine, I mean, he had to eat something, right? Had to drink something, you know? It would have been so much easier. I mean, no one would have had a mark on this guy. No one would have said, there's the troublemaker right there. None of those things would have happened if Daniel would have simply just compromised a little bit and just ate what everybody else ate. But he doesn't. But the thing that stands out the most about Daniel is how wise he is biblically. See, he's effective in reaching a culture because he has figured out how to do it the way God wants him to do it. That's very important that you catch this. If you remember, Daniel and lots of other young Hebrews got carted off into slavery. While they were there, they got re-educated. Then they were reculturated into the Babylonian culture and history and, and protocol. And it's interesting because when you look at Daniel's life under that circumstance, Daniel never complains about any of that. He goes from being a nobleman, which meant he had some sort of royal bloodline in him, to a slave. Does he complain? No. He goes from being highly educated in his own place, from, from, from the time he was a little boy, he would have been studying you know, in the word and understood you know, the writing of the, 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 the prophets and the Psalms and everything like that before him. But now he goes to another place and he's basically asked, ditch all of your own learning because now we're going to re-educate you. Now you've got to learn all of our rules and laws and traditions and customs and and all that kind of stuff because you need to know it better even than us so that we can call upon you for advice. No complaints. They even come along and they change his name. I mean, he's got this name that's God-honoring and now they give him this other name 
no complaints. But then they get to the breaking of God's law and he stands his ground. When it came to the food and the drink that was sacrificed to idols, that's where he's gonna make a stand. That is his conviction. Now look at verse eight here. We'll go back to where we're less left off and, and, and we'll start here. But Daniel says, resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank and therefore he asked of the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. He resolved that he would not defile himself. Now it's important that you catch what that means. He did not demonstrate at that point. He was not out to fight to change laws. He doesn't take a shot at Babylonian culture or its food. Daniel's conviction is, I will not defile myself. You see, Daniel realized it's not him against Babylon. I hope you catch this. What it is, is him for the Lord. Now, that may not sound like much, but it ends up being enough to have a profound impact on Babylonian society. And so what we're going to do this morning is we're going to look at four things that make Daniel a successful witness in this lost culture. The first thing is this, is you see that he's respectful. He's respectful. In other words, this is how Daniel is going to deal with authority. Verse 8 tells us that Daniel asks the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to to defile himself. He's respectful and he's polite. Now remember, Ashpenaz, who is the chief of the eunuchs of this thing, is not a God follower. This is not a godly man. This is a society that is, is built on, on excess and, and partying and, and many gods and all sorts of crazy and wild things. This is not a godly man. And yet, in this particular case, Daniel is respectful of his authority. He shows great respect here. In fact, we're told that that is exactly how you and I are supposed to respond to authority. Let me show you some. Keep your finger in Daniel. Go over to the right to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. Look at the first two verses here. Paul's writing here and he says, look, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists what God has appointed. And those resist will incur judgment. Wow. That's pretty heavy-duty words. I'm guessing that the leader of the known world at that time the Roman emperor must have been a pretty solid good guy. Right? For him to say that? No. Do you know who was in power when Paul wrote that? The book of Romans was written about A.D. 60. The Roman Caesar at that time from A.D. 58 to A.D. 64 was a guy named Nero. You know what Nero was famous for? One is he burned down Rome. But two is, he had this little ugly habit that he liked to, to do a lot to light up his, Chris, or his, his outdoor parties is that he would take Christians, tie them to poles, put tar all over them, light them on fire, and that's how they lit up their parties. And he writes and says, obey the authorities? It's not just him. Go back a little bit further to, to 1 Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2, look at verse 18. Peter here writes and he says, Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and to the gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. Do you catch what he's saying there? He's saying that I want you to obey the authorities that God has placed in your life even when they're not good. Why? Why in the world would God ever say anything like this? Why would that be the stand? Why does it matter so much that we be respectful of authority? I'll tell you simply, you know what? Authority problems are transferable. Let me spell it to you more like this. If you 
if you struggle with our government, you're gonna struggle ultimately with God. If you struggle with your boss at work, ultimately you'll like the way that you run things better than maybe God runs the kingdom, so you'll struggle with him. If you struggle in your home, if a kid struggles with his parents, he's always gonna sort, sort of see someone that maybe is, is, is above them and struggle with that. If a, if a wife struggles with a husband, we're always gonna struggle with this authority above it. Isn't there a place for us to simply place ourselves under authority and say, God, I need you to change things. But I'm going to personally do exactly what Daniel said and I will not defile myself. Daniel here is living obediently, respectfully. He doesn't demand his rights. He doesn't decry, cry out for discrimination. He doesn't belittle the king's food. He does not attack you know, his superiors. In fact, he asks, he makes it abundantly clear here that he is not looking for a fight. There's a big difference here between holding fast to our convictions and disagreeing with those that are above us. The truth is, is that respectfulness and politeness go a long way even with those that we disagree with. It's wooing. When you run across somebody that is respectful, their attitude is so winsome that we don't mind them telling us what they think because of the way that they treat us. Politeness, respectfulness makes people feel valued. It makes, them, makes us likable. It makes us disarming. It, it leaves an impression, and, and it's completely biblical. Paul, in Acts chapter 26, goes in before the king, and Agrippa is his name, and instead of just calling him Agrippa, he calls him King Agrippa. Then you go off and, you know, a few verses later in verse 26, and you get the Roman, sort of the, the, the manager for Rome of all of the Judean area. Festus comes along, and Paul, who could have referred to him in lots of different ways, but you know how he calls him? Most excellent Festus. You know what's interesting? I read an observation about Billy Graham from a White House staffer. And it, he wrote this. He said, somehow his manner had a deep effect on people. He was both friendly and effective at the same time. That, that's politeness. That's respect. That takes you out of the equation and lets God work. It doesn't become a personal battle. You know, in today's day and age, when we don't like something, we just complain. I mean, and it, it's, it's disrespect of authority is almost everywhere. In fact, there's a word now that's used everywhere, the word vitriol. The it, word actually means bitter or acidic, but really, it only has one meaning in our society today. It's when I disagree with somebody politically, it's what I say. Daniel does not do that. Daniel understands the wisdom of Solomon who writes in Proverbs chapter 15 verse 1, a gentle answer turns away wrath. Or Proverbs 16 verse 21, sweetness of speech increases effectiveness. So you know what Daniel does? He asks. And by the way, that was a big deal even to ask because that could have been seen as something that would have been a refusal of the king's table. It could have been a put down, an insult. It could have been a challenge to Nebuchadnezzar's authority. But he asks. And on top of that, you've got to remember that Daniel's in a situation with immense peer pressure. There were lots of gr groups of these young Hebrews that got carted away. They're all in there eating at this table. Imagine Daniel and his three friends separating themselves. I mean, you think there were eyes glaring at him at this point? Verse 8 is clear that Daniel had clear convictions. But what I, I see out of Daniel is the wisdom to know that convictions, when shared respectfully and politely, are way more effective And by the way, if you're struggling with authority, say, well, wait a minute, what am I supposed to do in that case? I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 1, has this wonderful promise to us. It says, the king's heart is like water in the hands of the Lord. He can turn it wherever he wishes. Do you know what we do in that situation while we're being respectful? Pray. Pray to the God that has greater authority than even the king, that he'll move the king, just like you would move water. Water. 
Now, there's a second thing. And that is, you see in Daniel, sincerity of faith. You really see a, a clear and sincere walk. Look what he says in verse 9. It says, And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. I love that. He gave them favor and compassion. Why? Because that is exactly what God does. When God takes us and he puts us into a dark place, if I'm willing to be his man or his woman in that place, he will use me regardless of the circumstances. There's a perfect example in Genesis chapter 39 where Joseph gets carted off into slavery into Egypt. He could have like complained, wow, my brothers hated me and these people hate me. They keep, they accuse me of false things. You know, God, why are you doing this? And they could have done all this. And yet he he lived in such a way that he got favor with all those people because God gave it to him and raised him up and he was able to save even his own people. Listen, don't think for a second that when things like this happen, like Daniel getting carted off into slavery, don't think for a second this is God's plan B. It's plan A. Well, how do you know that? Why would you say that, Bob? Bob? Well, because, you know, this may bother some of you, but Babylonian lives matter just as much as Hebrew lives to our God. And so God will strategically just send people into hurting lost areas. Maybe the company you work for is just full of people that hate God. God might send you there the neighborhood, the school district, whatever the case may be, he'll move you in there, not so you can argue with everybody, but so you'll be salt and light and be so wooing and winsome they'll be drawn to the message that you have. Go back to verse nine. It's interesting here that Asphanaz, the chief eunuch here, who was not a follower of Yahweh, but he is clearly impressed by Daniel's life. And that tells me a great deal about how Daniel carried himself. Now, Daniel saw the world that God put before him. Now, there's a third thing here, and that is humility. You really see it in Daniel. Look at verse 10 through 16. He says here, And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord, the king, who assigned your food and your drink, for why should he see that you were in worse condition than the youths who are in your own age? In other words, your group of people that were carted away into slavery. So that you would endanger my head with the king. And then Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the priests had, had assigned over Daniel and Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah, test your servants for 10 days. Let us eat vegetables to, to have to eat and to water to drink. And then let our appearances and our appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to whatever you see. And so we listened to them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate. And the kings, the kings, who ate the king's food. And so the steward took away their food and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. And by the way, let me just be really clear here. It is not God's will that you get fat from that. I just want to be clear here where it said that, okay? If you want to, that's your choice, but that's not God's will, okay? Okay. Um, What's so interesting here is that Daniel here refers to himself not as privileged, and he was. Even though he had been from noble birth and now carted off into slavery, he is being prepared at the very highest level to serve the king and his table. He could have said, listen, don't mess with me. I'm smarter than you. The king put me here to, you know, to serve him. Doesn't say any of that. He's very careful how he refers to himself, and at verse 12 tells us that he calls himself a servant. Now, I want to tell you something. That speaks volumes to me because, you see, how we carry ourselves is obvious. I mean, we all know people that we would look at and go, you know what? That guy's arrogant. He just sort of thinks he's better than everybody else. Or we've all been around people that they just... There's something amazing and wonderful and we like being around them because they're just humble. A pastor I used to work for years ago used to say there are only two types of people in the world. There's one who walks into the room and says, here I am. Meaning it's all about me. Who's going to serve me? Who's looking out for my best interests? Who, 
Who's noticed me? Who comes up and talks to me? I just stood there the whole time and nobody came up and talked to me. I can't tell you how many times I hear that from people when they go to church. Well, I went and nobody came and talked to me. Who did you go talk to? Well, I was just waiting to see who would come and talk to me. (laughs) Really? Then there's the other person who walks into the room and says, there you are. Who humbly takes the opportunity to go, Man, I'm so excited I can come here and serve and love on these people and meet them and greet them. And, and I gotta be honest with you. To me, it's obvious when you see that. There are only servants who think, and, and people who think they ought to be served. And Daniel here sees himself as a servant, which is kind of an important biblical attitude to have. Paul in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1, says that people ought to think of us as servants. Stop for a second. Do you realize who just said that? The chief writer of the New Testament, the primary evangelist of the world at that time, stops and says, wait a minute, I'm the bishop of... No, he doesn't say that. People ought to just see us as servants. Wow. Who can argue with that? Who can argue against that type of humility? I mean, who, who really in their right mind berates a servant? The Bible is clear that God detests arrogance. He is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Now, if you keep going here in verses 15 and 16, you're going to see the outcome. God obviously blesses Daniel and his friends. It's obvious to the Babylonians, and it ends up changing their thinking. And you know what's really interesting is the Babylonian kings and the whole royal family lived this really opulent lifestyle. I mean, they, they lived large. They went first class on everything. They partied hard. They, they drank and ate in excess. And their servants and their, their attendants ate and drank at the very same table. And so this was clearly a challenge to live out every single day. Now, there's a fourth thing, a last thing, and that is you see in Daniel and in his three friends a really strong work ethic, a strong work ethic. Look what he says, starting in verse 17. And as for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams, and at the end of the time when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, and the king spoke with them, and and among all of them, none was found like Daniel and Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah, and therefore they stood before the king, and in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and the enchanters who were in all his kingdom, and Daniel was there into the first year of King Cyrus. God's blessing is over all that they do there. In verse 17, it's clear that these guys were, 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 had excelled and they had intellectual achievement and spiritual insights. And in verse 20, you see that they have this new social standing. They really stand you know, before the king and they're experienced some set of personal you know, success. The result of it all is this, is that Daniel and his three, three friends have this powerful witness over the Babylonian kingdom and the king's court. Now think about that. Daniel is able to stand for the Lord, retain his integrity, have an appealing witness, and in the middle of it, God even honors and blesses him? See, the application here, folks, is really simple. We can succeed in honoring God in a world that doesn't by taking Daniel's example. He didn't fight about everything. But the things that broke God's law became clear conviction to him. And he drew the line there. He held his ground. But even in doing that, even in holding that conviction, he was wise biblically. How he held his ground was not to create an affront or or put something up between people. He was respectful. He was polite as he held that ground. He maintained a sincere witness because I want to tell you something. Anytime you stand for something, I guarantee you that people are going to be looking for for something where you do wrong. They're going to be watching to see if you're a hypocrite. He lived a sincere witness. He carried himself with a humble attitude because they could have easily said, well, we'll just sit back and watch how he sort of, he acts and how he thinks he is. Because to be honest, most of us can look at people and go, 
God, they kind of give across this attitude. His attitude is, was humble. And then through it all, they observed what he did, his work. And the guy put in more effort than everybody else. I mean, God just blessed that. They rose to the top. If you and I want to reach the world that God has put us in, folks, this is an outline for us to use. In your work, in your neighborhood, in the schools your kids are involved in, if we'll be willing to stand our ground, have clear convictions, but to do it tastefully with respect, God will bless that. I'm going to ask you to pray with me. Wherever you're at, would you just do a quick a little evaluation of perhaps how you've approached all this? Maybe you need to spend a little bit less time watching the TV news and a little bit more time in God's word to decide how you will deal with a lost world. Father, thank you. Thank you for taking your servant Daniel, putting him in a very difficult place and using him to affect change in a culture because for thousands of years, God, he's been providing a model for us to change our world. God, help us to learn not to be influenced by how the world reacts to things, but to be influenced only and solely by how you and your word teach us to deal with those that are lost. We want to be effective, God. We want to live lives that honor you. We want to live lives of sincerity and humility, recognizing that every good thing comes from your hand and your hand alone. And in the middle of it, God, we pray that the testimony, the taste that we would leave in people's mouths would be of humble servants who work hard for you. And then, God, we ask you to bless. And we ask it all in Jesus' name.